Destiny shares. Oops. Okay, Jeff is a teaching artist. He shares workshops and residencies in mime, theater, mask, circus arts, playwright, ensemble techniques, melodrama, and comedia um, de l'art, as well as in arts integration. He, along with Sheila Kerrigan, is the founding member of the South Southeast Center for Arts Integration. In 2010, he attended the Lincoln Center Institute for International Educator Workshop. He was a North Carolina a fellow from 2005 until 2021. He's also a performer, sharing his mime, variety arts, and mask theater for children and families at fairs and festivals throughout the South as the interactive theater of Jeff. Upcoming performances include performances for Earth Day Charlotte, Merle Fest, and the South Carolina Strawberry Festival. From 1976 to 1993, Jeff was a member of Touch, T-O-U-C-H, North Carolina's Touring Mime Theater Ensemble, alongside Sheila Kerrigan. From 1993 through 97, Jeff created the character and performed as Wool E. Bull, the mascot for the Durham Bulls baseball team. You guys are in great hands today with Jeff Lambden. So without further ado, I hand it over to you, Jeff. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Kimberly. Um, hello, webinarians, teaching artists and people who wanna be teaching artists near and far. Welcome to the South Carolina Arts Commission's second professional development workshop for teaching artists titled the Business of Being an Arts Grow SC Teaching Artist. And this topic is the South Carolina Educational Standards and Teaching Artistry. Okay. Now I'm Jeff Landon. I am a teaching artist and your host for these professional development workshops. To begin, I'd like to introduce you to the other folks who will be joining me today. All right, you've already met Kimberly Mott and Amanda Noyes, the, the co-pilot and pilot of this session. Um, Kimberly is the Arts Learning Director at the South Carolina Arts Commission, and Amanda is the K-12 Coordinator of the South Carolina Arts Commission. Since we're talking about standards, we have very special guests today. We have Roger Simpson. Wave to people, Roger, so they know which screen you're in. Roger is the Educational Associate for the Visual and Performing Arts of the South Carolina Department of Education. Office of Assessment and Standards. He wins the title for the longest title today. And we also have Kayla Jennings. Kayla waved everybody, there you are. Kayla is the dance teacher at Saluda River Academy of the Arts in West Columbia. Now, all of these folks will be jumping in later in the webinar. I just wanna remind you, today's event is two hours long and we will continue the discussion tomorrow from four to six for another two hour session. We design each of the sessions so that a topic is introduced and right after that topic will be a short time for questions. Today, your questions can be typed into the chat. And so enliven your chat by going down to the bottom. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom. You click on the little, little thing at the bottom. It's okay, folks. It's not your computers. Jeff's uh, Jeff's frozen. Yeah, <laughs> he told me earlier oh. that sometimes this happens to his internet. So yeah, don't worry. It's it's not you. It's him. <laughs> okay, I froze. Sorry. I live in a rural area, and I was telling Roger, unless I move to Raleigh, this is what I have to live with. But then I just raised my hand for you. I I could see the concern on people's faces, thinking what's going on? And I had that little too, but everybody else was still moving. So I said, okay, must be Jeff. Okay. Um, I see a question in here. Alicia says, is this only for public school system or also private schools and home schools? It is for everyone. Um, the teaching artist under the Arts Pro South Carolina um, program can work with any kind of school, charter schools, private schools, and um, homeschool groups, and 
public schools. Um, we're having thunderstorms, Sheila, and your connection. Okay, yours if here than mine. Okay, well, we'll have to live with this today. So Amanda, if you could go to slide one, please. All right, just in case we don't get to your questions, this is my contact information. And I am always available, as Anita will tell you. I am happy to meet with you. I'm happy to talk with you. I'm happy to Zoom with you. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about being a teaching artist with the South Carolina Arts Commission. And is right here for you. All right, so this information's here for you. We could go to slide two. All right, this is the second webinar. During the first webinar, we talked about the nuts and bolts of being a teaching artist, and we covered all of these topics in the course of our two days. Now, this is the cool thing. If we could go to slide three. All of these webinars are recorded, and as soon as they are available on the South Carolina Arts Commission YouTube channel, you will be notified. And Kimberly, why don't you take over and, and, sh and show them how to get there and what's already up? Yeah, sure. So um, you can access all of the videos from the past webinar series, as well as these, um, on the South Carolina Arts Commission's YouTube page. We have a playlist specifically for teaching artistry um, professional development videos. So I will drop that link in the chat in just one moment. So feel free to save that so that you will know where to go. But you will be emailed a link to this video recording as well. Thank you, Kimberly. All right, and then let's go to slide number four, what we're doing today. Our topic today is teaching artistry in the South Carolina educational standards. Now, during the webinar, during both days, what we hope to do is increase your fluency and understanding of this. They're called the South Carolina College and Career Ready Standards so that you as a teaching artist can use them in your residencies. And if we could stop sharing the screen, we'll get to work. Jeff's internet again. Give him a, just a second. Last time it was able to catch. All right, up. Roger. Welcome to the web. Roger, welcome to the webinar, and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, we'll give Amanda a second to get uh, my slides pulled up. Great. While she's doing this, I want to thank Jeff for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you guys a little bit. As he told you, I am the Education Associate for Visual and Performing Arts here at the South Carolina Department of Education. Uh, my job consists of three main areas. One is the standards. Two is professional development, which both are going on here right now. So that's two of the three. And the third big area are the arts grants that we issue to schools and districts from the Department of Education, which you all are often a part of, whether you realize or not. We can continue on to the next slide and just see the partnership that we have here with the uh, South Carolina Department of Education and the South Carolina Arts Commission. Um, you may or may not have heard about this Arts Grow and the background behind the project itself. Um, we have $20 million worth of um, ARPS or funds that were uh, were uh, earmarked for the arts and um, sent over to the Arts Commission to create those additional partnerships to help um, in the learning loss 
that happened through COVID. So continuing on to the next slide, just an idea of what we're going to go through over the next few minutes. It looks like a lot, but I attempt to be pretty short. First, we're going to discover the purpose of the standards, what we call the College and Career Ready Proficiency Standards for Visual and Performing Arts. We'll talk about the proficiency part of it here in just a moment. We'll come to realize why the standards are proficiency based, and then we'll visualize the common organizational structure used throughout all of the arts areas. That's our music, our art, our theater, and our dance areas. Going on to that next slide. Now, at the end of this session with me, you will know, I'll know that we were successful, one, by, uh, well, you're already here. That was my first success indicator that uh, folks would attend this webinar. So check that out. Woo, you've already uh, met, met success criteria number one. Um, what we'll also do at the end, uh, hopefully you'll be able to um, explain how the standards apply to your work and you'll be able to incorporate those standards into your work. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, and our next slide is just that title slide that's, that asks, what is the purpose of the College and Career Ready Standards for Visual and Performing Arts Proficiency? We'll go on to the next slide. Um, I, I, I try not to read every slide word for word, but I know there might be a couple of you that are um, logging in from a phone in the car, and you might not be able to see what we're looking at. So I want to make sure that we're accessible to everybody. So in general, and this is straight from the standards, page seven, the purpose of the standards is to clarify and define a progression of learning in user-friendly language that learners can easily interpret. And so we want to make sure that, that we understand that the standards go beyond just use by teachers, they're for use by the learners themselves, the students, teachers, obviously, but also parents, administrators, and other stakeholders such as yourselves um, have a, a, an opportunity to use the standards. And we want to make sure that, that they're easily understandable by all of those parties. So as we continue on, let's look at some of these specifics for the different groups. So in the next slide, we have purpose for learners. Well, we do, believe it or not, want the kids themselves to actually know how to find the standards and be able to self-assess in the standards and see where they can go and where they should be. So for learners, we begin by demystifying learning in the arts by simplifying and clarifying the process so that it's easy for not only teachers and and, and other adults to understand, but also the students that are learning from the standards. We, we wanna make sure that, that learners understand that the standards provide clear descriptions of what can be achieved at various proficiency levels and make expectations more realistic, um, particularly for a student who may be gifted in the arts and be able to do more than where they're at at their proficiency level with the class and have that opportunity for them to see where they could go. And we also wanna offer small incremental and achievable goals that learners can use to set personal goals, self-assess and chart their own progress. Now the next slide takes us into the teacher perspective with the standards. So teachers use the standards to guide learning more towards functional goals providing examples of learning targets, these lesson scenarios, which can be used across all ages, class levels, or content. And also for teachers, we want to clarify skills needed by learners to move from one level to the next. So what are the skills that shoot students should be able to perform at the various levels? And that's going to come into play with you all in just a moment. On the next slide, we take it to our other stakeholders. So as you're looking at the standards, regardless of what area, music, visual arts, dance, or theater, hopefully what you'll find are user-friendly terminology, um, in each of the areas, regardless of the course, unit, or lesson. Also, the standards help define exactly what is expected of the learners at different levels of proficiency. Again, we're saying different levels of proficiency and where the learners are at. Again, that can help you as well. Continuing on to the next slide, now let's take a look at why the College and Career Ready Proficiency Standards apply to all learners regardless of grade level. Well, when it comes to the proficiency standards, our next slide shows us that proficiency 
is what we're we're basing things off of, not promotion, not what grade they're in. Now, there are certain things that we, you know, we we expect that a student at different levels should be able to to achieve but if we think about the arts you can enter the arts at any age or grade level so to say that um a uh, a ninth grader who is entering visual art for the first time uh isn't a beginner it is is difficult and if we have our our standards that are laid out and in ninth grade with all this prior knowledge they should be here well that ninth grader may be way behind so that's why our, our standards are laid out in proficiency levels to give teachers um, and teaching artists such as yourselves the ability to find exactly where the students are at um, and and what we have here in the slide learners progress towards proficiency at different rates and at proficiency uh, at the proficiency level they reach is often determined by the amount of instructional time and courses offered in visual and performing arts therefore learners at similar ages frequently demonstrate varying proficiency levels for this reason the college career ready proficiency standards outline a progression of learner skills rather than grade level, which makes, which makes it easier for teachers to identify and differentiate learning for all teachers. So if you're not able to see, that's what this slide is actually telling us there. Moving on, let's uh, let's take a look at um, what those proficiency levels look like. Now, regardless of what arts area standard you're going to be digging into or looking at, all of the standards, all of the, the arts areas have the standards leveled in three ways. The first level is novice. That is for students with very little to no prior experience in that arts area. They are in the very, very beginning fundamental stages of learning in that area. Then they're broken next into intermediate levels where learners see some patterns um, artistic principles, they can begin to make connections on their own, but their skill set is still limited. And then we have the advanced level in which the students are hopefully at this point able to, to not only perform the skills with success, but be able to, to, to think more about it, to solve predictable problems, to make decisions based on those skills. Now, novice, intermediate, and advanced are the three large proficiency levels, but within each of those levels, we have them broken up into three more subsets of levels where there's a low, mid, and high in each level. So within the, let's say, visual art standards, at the novice level, there is a novice low, novice mid, novice high, same for intermediate, same for advanced. So, so we have really, even though there are three levels here, each standard is divided into nine different um, levels altogether. All right, continuing on, now let's talk about how the standards are organized. And we'll go to the, to the next slide, and you'll see that, that all of the standards are organized in the same way. So, so once you understand the structure, then you can go from one set of standards to another and, and have that continuity and be able to dive in a little more quickly. Now, what we're doing is just a very surface uh, look at the standards. In just a few minutes, you'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into one of those areas. But within the standards, we have um, the artistic process, which is the, the big main idea. We have the standard itself. We have the benchmark, which, which is really um, an idea of how the standard looks at the defined level. Okay, and then we have indicators. Okay, indicators are, are what the teacher used to show that the benchmarks are being achieved. And then we have sample learning targets. And, and the reason it says sample is because there are a couple of learning targets. And, and what, what is a learning target? Well, that's, that's what it looks like in the classroom. That's the lesson itself. What are the students actually doing to show their proficiency um, in that skill. Now, as you look through, you might not see learning targets that are specifically close to what you do. And that's okay, because you're able to align what you do as a learning target to meet that standard. So we'll move on to the next slide. And we see 
what are the artistic processes? Here we're getting more closely related to what you're doing. So within all of the standards, there are four artistic processes. Students, when it comes to um, their learning, see that slide is a little off right there. We have creating. Every student in all other standards, there's creating. There's performing, presenting, or producing based on the standard. There's responding, and there's connecting. Now, we, we know as um, visual and performing artists that much of what we do has to do with performing of some sort, presenting of some sort, or producing of some sort. And, and that's a lot of times what, what you're doing when you go into the schools. But what I'm hoping you're able to do is look a little more and, and see maybe how can we provide an opportunity for students to respond to the learning? How can we provide an opportunity for the students to connect? And what's really neat is that um, for many of our classroom teachers, you know, we're kind of generalists. We, we, we do a little bit of everything along the way to be able to teach the students, but you are specialists. You are content specialists in your area. And a lot of times your knowledge of that area is much, much deeper than the teachers. And so there's a great opportunity for you to be able to help the students connect to what you do and the history of that. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to, to find in those standards ways that you can help the students to connect a little bit more. Let's go down to the next slide. And um, after the artistic process, let's take a look at what the standards will look like in the, the book or online. And here is a, a snapshot of uh, one area itself. I'm going to um, remove that so I can see a little better. And um, this is one of our uh, first standards and our new standards, the design standards. So the uh, if you go to the Department of Education website and you go to um, educators and you look for standards and you go to those art standards, within each of the art standards, music, visual arts, theater and dance, it has those standards, but then also are the media arts standards and our design standards. The media arts and design standards are the same regardless of the area. So those are the same. It is the content standards arts that are different. And so the uh, design standards are new and it's getting the kids thinking from a design perspective. So um, let's go to the next slide. Let's make this um, image a little bit bigger and see how each of those fit into the way it actually looks. So we talked about the artistic process, the creating, the performing, presenting, producing, the um, connecting, and the responding. So at the very top is the process. Here in our first design standard, creating, the students will be able to conceive, develop a new design idea or work. The next thing down you're going to see is the anchor standard. So within each artistic process, there are one or two or three anchor standards. These are, these are kind of the, the rooting standard for each of those areas. In this one in particular, I can conceive and develop a design challenge. And then the next down is what I particularly wanted you to see because this is when it gets confusing for some people. Here's the breakup of the low the mid and the high for um, the novice, intermediate, and advanced. So you see, as it goes across, I've got proficiency levels listed there. You have three levels of novice, three levels of intermediate, three levels of advanced. And so you have a low, mid, and high, and you have the benchmark, which we talked about. Now, the benchmark to you, you're going to look at it, and it's going to look like a lot of numbers. And a lot of times, that's that's just a, a reference point. Um, when, when teachers have to submit lesson plans, they're going to put those benchmark numbers in their lesson plans so that, that we see that. So that might be something that you might be asked somewhere along the way. What are the, what are the benchmarks that the, the students will be um, uh, uh, achieving at? Next down, we're looking at the learning indicators that is going across there. And also there are numbers that go along with those. You'll see um, in both the benchmark and the learning indicators, a similar set of numbers. At the novice low level, you've got um, the benchmark or the indicator. There's DE, which is short for design. Music would be MU. Um, media arts would be MA. So there's DE design. CR, creating, that is the artistic process. NL, novice level, 
and number one, this is anchor standard number one. And then indicator 1.1, the next indicator down would be 1.2. So that's the structure and that's the continuity you're gonna find from one standard to the next as you dig in a little bit more. All right, going on down to the next slide. Let's talk through a couple of scenarios. Now, now we're gonna get very specific to um, what you are doing with, um, with the school. So let's say that you as a teaching artist um, have a DAP school that reaches out to you and wants to schedule residency and asks how you incorporate the South Carolina College and Career Ready Proficiency Standards for Visual and Performing Arts into your work. A few questions for you there. Think to yourself, if you see the questions, go ahead and start reading and thinking to yourself. Think how you would respond. If you can't see them, I'll read them to you. First question. Um, first, do you know what a DAP school is? Second question, do you know why they're asking you about the standards? Third question, can you provide an immediate response? Just take a moment to, to ponder those things. And, and we got a question in the chat, what's a DAP school? That's a great question. I'll tell you here in a second. All right, continue pondering, thinking through those, but what is a DAP school? Well, that's a great question. So DAP is short for Distinguished Arts Program. Um, the South Carolina Department of Education has several grant programs available to schools and districts through the Arts Curricular Innovation Grants. So the innovation grants are set up to um, help schools. One of the reasons is to um, implement uh, innovative practices to meet the visual and performing arts standards. So it could be a DAP school, a Distinguished Arts Program grant school. It could be an EAAP grant school. That's a, a school that has received an equitable, equitable arts advancement program grant. And so those, those are there. And part of the grant process is implementation of the standards. So what is a DAP school? What is an EAAP school? Those are schools that have received grant funding from the South Carolina Department of Education. Why are they asking you about the standards? Well, because part of that grant process has to do with making sure that we're implementing the, the standards in good teaching practices within the schools. Could you provide an immediate response? If not, then they're probably gonna find somebody and whoever can give them that response of how they're implementing the standards will be who they go with. Because in that final report for these grant funding grants, of which the funding they use to pay teaching artists, they have to show how they were implementing the standards. And so when you can coordinate what you do with those standards, then you've got it made. And a lot of folks think, well, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't know how I'm going to do. It. Well, the standards are laid out so that you can take whatever you're already doing and place it within those proficiency levels. So it's not a matter of how do I, how do I make what make what I'm doing fit the standards. It's how are you fitting the standards into what you're already doing? And I, I think you'll find it a lot easier than you would expect. Let's go to scenario two. I've got another one for you. Next slide. So a middle school reaches out to you to schedule residency for a group of sixth graders. You generally work with high schools, but your schedule is free, which if your schedule is free, which means, you know, you're not getting paid. So yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll schedule a contract with, with this school. All right. So in this situation where you're about to work with a group of kids at an age that you maybe not often do, some things for you to ponder for a moment. What resources available to assist you in your planning? How can you know what students will be able to do? Who do you talk to about the students' proficiency levels? Take a moment to ponder that, to kind of think to yourselves. All right, I've got a fun activity for us really quick. All right, so I'm looking at everybody's faces right now, well, most of us on the screen with your mics off, and it's gonna sound strange, but what I actually want you to do is respond to me with those questions. So share a response with me. I wanna see your facial expression. I wanna see your, your lips moving. I wanna see those words. Share with me what you think, what resources available. How do you know what level the kids would be at? Who could you talk to? Share with me, let me see your faces.
All right, so a couple of people still. Most most people have, have wrapped up. It was, it was interesting. I, I saw a lot of a lot of these uh, frowny lines right here, kind of thinking, uh, hmm, I, I don't know, because uh, because mine are very strong. So, what resources available? What well, this is where you can go to the standards. This is where the proficiency levels in the standards can help you to know, based on where the students are typically at that you're used to working with, what they would be able to do because of what you see there in the standards. Use the standards. How do you know what the students will be able to do? Well, that's where we base things on the proficiency levels. So even though you're gonna be working with high school kids, you may be inclined to go to the standards and go to the advanced proficiency level. But the students might not be at the advanced level even though they're in high school. So how do you know? Well, talk with the teacher or teachers at that school of the students who you will be specifically working with. And it's important that it's at that school and those teachers, because you could talk to a high school teacher that you know at another school, but those students might be in a different place of proficiency because of their background experience and learning opportunities. So be sure to talk with the teachers at that school. Whoever is contracted with you, get that conf uh, contact information for the teachers who teach the students you'll be working with and, and ask them. They'll be able to share with you. They probably won't even have to think about it or go and look at the standards. What level of proficiency are the kids at in this area? And they'll be able to tell you, well, they're at they're at the novice level, or most of these kids are at the, the, the intermediate high, but we have this group that are really kind of at the, the novice high because they just started, but they're progressing quickly. So that'll help you be able to key in specifically where in the standards those kids are. And like I said, take what you do and make it fit into those standards or make the standards work for what you do. You can find that, find that place, and be able to adjust what you do if you need to, to get students to a different level. And a lot of times when it comes to what you're doing and what you can get from the kids, it's not necessarily a matter of can they do more or can they do something uh, more advanced, but it's the thinking process. You can get them to think more about it. You can get them to respond more. You can get more um, of, of that, that cognitive side of the skill as opposed to the, the performance side. So take that opportunity to, uh, to find those. All right, so those were uh, just a couple of scenarios for you. Hopefully that, uh, that got you thinking a little bit. We go back onto the next slide. And um, here we are, we're drawing towards the end of the presentation. So let's take a decapo. If you're a music person, you know what that is. Decapo, we're gonna go back to the beginning. So let's uh, review just a bit. Next slide. In the beginning, what were we going to do? We we're going to learn about the standards. We we're going to realize that they're based on proficiency, and we we're going to look at the common structure among them. Let's go on to the next slide. Let's uh, check our success criteria. I've seen many of you are on a computer. Hopefully, you have your um, your phone next to you. So, so many people see a QR code and they say, "Oh my gosh, oh, what do I do with that?" All right, if you have an iPhone, take your iPhone and um, turn on your camera. And uh, there we go. Turn on your camera on your phone and you hold it right there in front and you're going to get a, a, a link come up in the picture that you can click on and take a little survey for me. Um, if you can't do that, I'm going to put in the chat right now the link. All you do got to do is copy and paste or click that link and you can put it into the um, into, uh, uh, you know, into the, the web bar and um, pull up this little survey for me. So while you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit in the background. What I'm going to ask you to do there is, is let me know how, how often you referred to the standards before, how often you think you might refer to the standards moving forward now that we've talked about them a little bit, and hopefully maybe there's something appealing that you think you might be interested in checking out, and then uh, be able to just explain to me in a few words how those standards apply to your work. While you're doing that, we'll move on so we can we can wrap up this portion. I'm a little under time, which amazes me. So that's great. So um, Amanda, while you're doing there, you click onto that next slide. Just a a couple of of thank yous to to some folks, of course, um, for all of you. I, I thank you not only for being here, but for, for your, your thinking being shared 
during this time and this last few minutes, especially with this, this survey. Jeff, it's great meeting you, hanging out here in the office for a little bit, getting to know, looking forward to knowing you and working with you more in the future. Amanda and Kimberly and Ashley and David at the Arts Commission are great people, love talking to and working with all of those folks. And here at the department, my team lead, Sandra, Dr. Melton, my director, were, were very, very helpful with me in putting this together. Uh, next week, I celebrate my third month anniversary here on the job. I'm very, very new into this position. Spent 18 years in the classroom and um, life uh, took me on an unexpected journey here into this office and I absolutely love it. I'm excited about what is coming. And um, if you uh, are not from South Carolina or not aware, we are about to lose one of the most arts supportive superintendents of education um, that's probably been in existence. Superintendent Spearman, who started her career as an elementary music teacher and worked her way up through the ranks and, and uh, is our superintendent of education. We are retiring at the end of this year. And so we are, we are so thankful to have had her. Um, and as part of kind of this, this uh, uh, last year, um, allotting this this arts grow money to uh, to to be used. So, Jeff, thanks so much. Um, we've got that time for for questions, and and so you said there'll be a little bit of time for questions after each. So, thank you, Amanda, for running those slides. I appreciate it. Excellent. Roger, I think you had one question in the chat box. Which yeah, there was one earlier. Yay. Yep. Okay. Um, now, did it, as soon as I spoke, I froze, right? Yeah, you did. That's right. Okay. So somebody asked say, what a DAP school yeah. was. Um, and DAP, of course, as I said, was our Distinguished Arts Program School. It's a grant program that's available from the Department of Education. Um, and those schools, many of the schools that you're going to get phone calls from are those who are receiving grant funds from one of these two sources or ABC. And somebody asked about ABC. And uh, the difference between those, um, DAP and EAAP are uh, South Carolina Department of Education grants. ABC is a school certification program, which also comes with some funding um, to support arts curriculum uh, in, our, in the schools. Um, and then uh, there is also funding that is coming from the Arts Commission for schools as well. And I don't know if um, Amanda or Kimberly would want to uh, uh, speak towards some of those commission grants that the teachers are also receiving. Sure, yeah, um, I definitely can share about that. We have um, different teacher level grants um, that are available. And um, this past fiscal year, we've had the arts teacher support grant. Um, and it's a smaller grant program that individual arts teachers can um, apply for. And it's monies that can fund different initiatives in their classrooms, but it can fund artists in residencies. And often they do. Um, and so it's a way for teachers to bring in teaching artists into their classrooms and pay for them. Um, this next year, um, that's going to be changing to the school art support grant. Um, it's a similar grant program. Um, it's a little bit uh, a little bit broader in the scope of what it can cover, and it's really um, touching on arts integration, um, which Jeff is going to talk about here soon as well. Um, and we're really pushing towards um, schools thinking about how to how to um, how to increase their arts integration efforts. Um, and so, yes, if you ever have questions about those grant programs or if you have teachers that are wanting to know how to fund you in their schools, um, you can definitely have them look at our website and watch for those grant programs. Um, or they can reach out to me um, or to Kimberly or to the commission and we'll be happy to answer any of those questions about those grant programs. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and um, earlier today, I'll tell you, I got an email from a school, hey, you know, we, we want to do a residency, you know, how do we find someone? And I'll tell you, I said, well, here's the link to the Arts Commission's um, Arts Directory, and you can do a search right here. So um, that is where our schools are going to, uh, to look for um, those who can come in and do the residency. So, um, you know, being here and being a part of this is uh, that, that right step for you all. Yeah, thank you, Roger. And with those um, grant 
with the, the with our grant um, programs, schools have to choose someone from the arts directory um, if they are bringing in an artist artist in residency um, and they're paying for it with a grant from the commission. And um, it does need to be a South Carolina Arts Commission arts directory um, uh, artist. Words so if, not coming if to I me. Can, if I can <laughs> in, um, that means all of you teaching artists. You want to get yourself on the directory so you have access to the programs that have the funding. If you are not in the directory, you will not have access. There's actually another Arts Pro SC program in which any teacher who teaches an art form in a school has access to $3,000. And that means that even teachers in non-DAP, EAAP, uh, it's a teacher in any school, it can be a charter school, they can get $3,000 if they teach an art form and, they, and it's a very simple application. So, you, but to get access to any of this, you must be on the artist, on, on the directory, the South Carolina Arts Directory. Any, okay, other questions, either raise your electronic hand or put it in the chat. Is the $3,000 just K-12? For, right for right now, the school art support grant will be for K-12, but um, starting this next fiscal year, which for us begins July the 1st, we will have some grants for early childhood education as well. So that's sort of a new thing that the commission is, is doing through Arts Grow SC. Um, so that so right now k-12 but it will be also available for early childhood education some various um, grant programs someone also had a question about the directory um, about whether or not if they've applied before if they need to re-register to get on the directory um, our directory is on a three-year cycle so once you have filled out the application and gotten on the arts directory um, you are on that directory for three years. After that three year period, you do have to reapply. So you do have to reapply by updating your information to, to continue to be on the directory. So you may wanna check out if your listing is still live on the directory's website. Um, and I can drop that in the chat here in just a few minutes. And if it is not, then you will have to reapply. And then there was another question in the chat about um, are, are the grants eligible to home schools? So for the South Carolina Department of Education grants, um, uh, the, the short answer is unfortunately no. The EAAP grant is specifically designed um, to be awarded to our Title I schools and schools that have been identified as priority schools by the department. The DAP grant um, specifically um, states um, K-12 public schools um, are eligible for, for that grant funding. Also, the DAP grant funding being that it's distinguished arts program, the expectation is that they're offering all four of the arts areas in some way. So they're doing the music, the visual art, the theater, and the dance. Excellent. Uh, other questions, raise your electronic hand or type them into the chat for Roger while he's still with us about the standards, the format, the use thereof. What do you want to know? I've also just dropped the link to the arts directory in the chat box. The application for the arts directory can be found on that page as well. So you can read about what the criteria for being listed on the arts directory is. Um, and you can fill out your application there. Now, once you are listed on the arts directory, you can also go a step further and be a certified teaching artist, which is an additional credential um, on top of the um, just being listed on the directory. And there are some advantages to that. So if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out. But the first step is the directory. You have to be listed on the directory to then go on to apply for that teaching artist certification. Anything else for Roger? 
Well, Jeff, I, I think, you know, I must have answered all of the questions you're, because you're everybody of. is quiet. I, I, <laughs> I can tell by the nods of heads uh, that people are agreeing or nodding off, one of the two. <laughs> well, uh, on behalf of all of us, we thank you, Roger. That was excellent and really thank informative. You. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to stick around and, and I want to hear okay. uh, Kayla also um, tomorrow. Uh, I have another meeting that's scheduled concurrently with this, so I probably won't be able to be with us tomorrow. But um, if any questions come up tomorrow as a result, um, you know, Jeff, let me know and I can uh, I can get back on those. And he's frozen. So he said, yes, Roger, thank you. I'll be happy to uh, to let you know uh, those things. And he's still frozen. So uh, I'll be the new Jeff. So we've got old Jeff and new Jeff, but not not by age, just by the amount of time you've you've known each other. So uh, uh, nope, he's still frozen. Oh, there you are. Uh, welcome yeah. back. <laughs> and he's frozen again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Amanda. So, Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you for your time, Roger. We really appreciate it. Jeff, we're not hearing you. You're muted. Well, those thunderstorms reached here and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and I've reconnected. Okay, welcome to Zoom World. All right, thank you, Roger. All right, um, we're going to do something with this information now. This is an exercise for all of you who are here, and you'll need a piece of paper and a pencil or pen to do this. So get your supplies together. And then, Amanda, if you could give me my slide five, please. pilot of our aircraft today. Okay. All right, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, from your main art form, I want you to think of one exercise that you usually do when you teach your students. And you and I both know that, like when I teach mime, I teach a similar exercises in a college as I do in a kindergarten because there are fundamental things that people need to know about mine. Okay, I'm not frozen. Good. And I want you to write a two sentence description of that exercise or lesson that you always teach in your practice. So write it down, take a minute. Okay, are we close? Touch your nose if you've got it done so I can see you, you, you've done it. Okay, good, Henry's ready. All right, Devlin's ready. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please, Amanda. Because here's what we're gonna do with that idea. We are going to give you the links in the chat from the 2017 South Carolina College and Career Ready Standards for Visual and Performing Arts Proficiency. I want you to examine the one from your art form. So you'll click on your particular art form, right? And I want you to see if you can determine a benchmark you know, for that ref best reflects your lesson. And then I want you to write down all those little letters and numbers that Roger led you through on your same piece of paper. So you have a correlation. I teach this exercise. I see it here in the standards. 
And Amanda, if you'll tell us how you're going to set this up, we would be appreciative. All right, first, let me go ahead and drop those into the chat for you. So those are all in the chat for everyone to be able to check out. Um, so while you're perusing that, if you can kind of keep an eye on your screen as well, um, we set up a jam board. I don't know if you all have done jam boards before. They're new to me, but I'm gonna um, share my screen and show you the jam board. So once you're ready, um, then you're gonna be able to share what you were able to connect to your art form. Um, so we can all talk about them together. So let me pull up. The right page here. So this is the Jamboard. Um, once you, I'm gonna share the link with you here in a second. Um, once you're on this page, then you see these tools over to the left. Um, if you click on this little kind of piece of paper here, it's going to open up a sticky note and you're going to be able to type in your art form and the standard that it correlates to. You can change your color if you want to. Um, then you're going to be able to hit save and then you're just going to have to click out of this box and it will show up on our board here and we'll be able to see them all together. And that will be a separate link in a moment. All right. So right now, go to your art form you have your exercise written down and see if you can't determine a correlation between the, the standards a benchmark and your lesson so go ahead click on your art form and get to work for a minute or two and we're here and live to help you so if you have Kimberly, Amanda, Roger, I, Kayla, we can all help. And I'm frozen again. We all can help. You were just briefly frozen. You're 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 back. <laughs> As you're working through, remember we have those those four artistic processes. So once you have what you you would have the students do, first determine is it creating, is it performing, presenting, or um producing is it responding or is it connecting so start with with that artistic process okay to to hone your way into where specifically you're going to find your placement for your indicator to find the benchmark and really think about your main goal for your activity cuz you're going to end up doing a lot um, as arts educators, we tend to, to pack a lot in, but we want to really think about the, the main part of it. Right. I encourage people not to be a Chinese menu writer. Yes, we might have a little writing in the exercise, but in mime, is that really what we Yeah, you definitely want to avoid listing every standard um, in your every every possible thing that you <laughs> that you're touching on just your big idea i'm being frozen <laughs> oh uh, jeff i was about to take a picture of you as like that is an amazing frozen pose but you're doing it on purpose i love it <laughs> it's very mime of you okay well we'll 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 post the sticky note link is everybody has everybody got something touch your chin if you're ready to move on oh Amanda just put it there. So you go to the Jamboard and you will be able to manipulate it. And then Amanda will bring it up with all of our information on it. And like I said, we'll stay here. You have lots of people who can help.
How's it looking, Amanda? Looks like I see um, there are several people logged in. If the first sticky note's been placed. Excellent. Sheila likes sticky notes. You can also adjust the size and placement of your sticky note by kind of pulling on the corner or just dragging your sticky note to a, a spot. For the people who are watching this when it's a video link, this is going to be very exciting. <laughs> I'll be waiting for the grand reveal. Oh no, really. We should be playing some some of that music like they do in Jeopardy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> na, 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 na. Oh wait, it's probably copyrighted. I can't even see it. <laughs> Jeff, you can just do a little performance for us while we Yeah, right. Now, <laughs> while, while they're working, you want me to distract them. <laughs> Sheila and I can do a duet from different screens. Mm. <laughs> now Sheila's frozen. <laughs> and Kayla's frozen. <laughs> We started a movement. Of Jeff frozen. <clears throat> How are we looking, Amanda? Two up. I want to know why I'm not freezing now. I only freeze when I talk. <laughs> I can go ahead and share the jam board so we can all look at it together if that's. Sure. Good Let's see what we got. All right. We'll try it. So people will have to kind of shift between going back to look at your Zoom screen once you're uh, done adding to your to the jam board. Excellent. Good job. Alicia, how do you publish the text in the Jamboard? Amanda? Are you working on a, if you're working on a sticky note, once you, there, you should see that there's a save button on the like lower right hand side. All right, thank you, David. All right, I see four. Are other people still working? One, two, three, four, five, including me, okay? Plus five, six, so 11 are on. Alicia, if you can't get your 
post maybe if you just want to put it in the chat and that we can see it there. That'll work too. Benchmark visual arts anchor stick project object painted in three color harmonies. Good. The exercise is please draw a basic circle and make a ball and color the ball in black and white to form a 3D shape. The goal is to assess student artistic ability. Now this will go ahead. All right. I can't get it to post. I've never used this. I'm so sorry. So I'll put the, um, Alicia, just put it in the chat. And to do that, you go to the bottom right of your screen where you have the chat going and it says to everyone and type it in there. And we will see it. I see someone drawing. Is that oh, is that the example of the the basic circle in three D? Nice. Oh, okay. There's Visualize an image. Oh. Ah. Well, I guess Alicia, we can see yours. <laughs> Visualize an image based upon a prompt. Share a word, phrase, or sentence based on your visualization. Okay. And what standard do you see correlating to that? Oh, another circle. Hey, this is Alicia. I'm just gonna pipe in here. Yeah, Mom, that's good. Please draw the basic circle to make a ball. And I put the numbers down there and I see somebody drew a ball. It wasn't me. So apparently they get the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're actually posted. I can read it. Yeah, I just couldn't color it. Oh, OK. OK. I didn't know it posted either, by the way. So sorry. That's my first time. That's all right. We're, we're all inventing. This is our first time using a Jamboard in a webinar, too. So <laughs> welcome. OK, I see another one being posted up. I need a magnifying glass. And they're making it bigger, good. I can apply traditional and contemporary artistic processes to my artwork. Cool. Cool. So there's seven. And that's seven out of 13. Okay, well, I'm seeing great correlations here. Is there somebody that, um, yeah, Amanda, let's, let's go ahead and go back to the gallery again, please. Is there somebody that would like to share any discoveries you just made by doing that simple exercise? What did you what did you discover about the standards about using them anything at all? And you could just raise your electronic hand or type it in the chat. The reason I encourage you to raise your electronic hand is it puts you at the top of the queue and I can see you rather than just raising your hand like this. Good.
<laughs> okay, any epiphanies, pertinencies, anything at all? Okay. This is the kind of work I encourage you to do on a regular basis. Um, what I do with, with my work is when I'm thinking about doing a residency, I actually go through all the exercises that I plan on teaching and I find the corresponding standards so that when I present it to the, the arts coordinator at the school, I, as Roger said, I show them I am prepared to utilize the standards so they can get their grant money to pay me, right? And I, incur I say on a regular basis because by law in South Carolina, the standards for each subject are updated on a certain schedule. And what that means is every year there is a new standard. It might be science, it might be social studies. Um, currently, the science standards are, are finished updating and you can use either model, the old one or the new one until next year when you must use the new one. And the vision, the art standards, are, are you getting committees together now, right, Roger? Yeah, and because they need to be done in two years. Is that, am I correct in that? So they're always being updated. You always have to keep looking at them. Um, do not be the teaching artist who uses the old um, the standards because all of the teachers will know. And I'm not saying you have to be able to quote it chapter and verse. You have to be able to be fluent enough to find what you need. And you don't need to change what you do. You need to find it in the standards. And, it, and it's in there, by and large. Okay? So here, this, I'm opening up the floor. What questions do you have about your art form and the standards? Crickets. We're good. Okay. Well, then we're going to go on. Um, Kayla, are you ready to jump in? All right. Now, Kayla Jennings is the dance teacher at Saluda River Academy of the Arts in West Columbia. Kayla has had the opportunity to serve on the panel that created the latest version of the dance standards. And I'd love for her to share what goes on in the process for creating the standards. Because as an artist, I'm, I'm often asked, what do you think about those standards? And my pat answer is, I think they're fine. The committee worked hard to determine where to place the standards and what grade level or proficiency level to place them. And it's way above my pay grade, right? Because that I'm, as a teaching artist, my job is to teach to the standards I'm given. And it doesn't matter if I'm in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, they're all different. And I have to be able to discern where I fit within them. So Kayla, hey. if you would, join us. All right. Um, are my slides? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So again, my name is Kayla Jennings, and I am a dance educator at Saluda River Academy for the Arts, um, which is located in West Columbia. So back in 2016, I was selected to help rewrite the dance standards for South Carolina. Um, it all started off of a, in a building off of Bush River Road where we met as a very large group and we were handed the profile of a South Carolina graduate as well as the National Core Arts Standards. Um, if you'll move to the next slide. Thank you. So this is our profile of a South Carolina graduate. As you can see, that there are three main areas, the world-class knowledge, world-class skills, and then the life and career characteristics. Well, guys, as arts educators, we already knew that we were providing world-class knowledge because we had these 
already we had standards in place, but we needed to make sure that we were clear on our expectations of what we wanted our teachers <laughs> to teach and what we wanted our students to be able to know. That is why we switched to those I can statements um, that Mr. Simpson um, spoke about earlier. So those I can statements, we put it in kid friendly language um, so that we all knew what those expectations were. Um, we also included some of those sample learning targets to again, make it clear as to what each of those proficiency levels, those standards and indicators meant when we saw it in the classroom. Now, as we moved over to our world-class skills, where it's talking about creative, creativity and innovation, well, yeah, that's the arts right there. Um, we provide those world-class skills, but we also needed to make sure that it was worded that way, which is one of the reasons why we moved in to using those four artistic processes from the National Core Arts Standards, which were actually just released in 2016. Um, and it was this whole new artistic processes that they had just released. And we decided that we like those. And so we adopted them. Um, and we have, if you'll move to the next slide, I think. Yes, thank you. So we have creating, the performing, presenting, or producing, responding, and connecting. Um, those four artistic processes also help to streamline all of our art standards. Prior to this um, rewriting of the standards, they all just kind of look different and um, how they were organized. Now, um, when I'm doing my dance projects and I want to incorporate the media arts or design standards, I can easily find what I'm looking for because it is divided into those four artistic processes um, and just makes it easier going through. If you'll move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the creating, this is where students are making the decisions on how to create or improvise, explore, or just to make their art. I will tell you that when we were writing these standards and deciding where the benchmarks went between creating and performing, um, it, it got a little confusing. <laughs> so you have to really think about, are the students creating it or are they simply performing what they, like they're already they have this knowledge they've already per, like have those skills that's performing that's presenting if they are responsible for creating the material then you're gonna find what indicators you need under the creating artistic processes um the presenting like i mentioned that is when the students are have already learned those skills necessary to present or perform. I'm sorry, it's the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is when we can find that the, the standards say, I can sing, yada, yada, yada. Um, or for dance, I can replicate a movement sequence um, because they have created it themselves or we have, as educators have given them the skills and they are showing them to us through this presenting. Um, so those two I know can get very confusing, but really think about it. If the students are creating, then it's gonna be the creating artistic process. If they are showing it, either by singing or playing, dancing, acting, that would be in that presenting um, artistic process. Next slide. Um, so, when we talk about the responding, all right, this is where the students are actually able to talk about it, which goes back to that world-class skills of being able to communicate information. They need to be able to use their arts vocabulary 
to talk about it. And again, that reinforces that world-class skill of communicating that information. And it can be them actually talking about it. It can be that they've, they're writing about their process or their product. They're reflecting on their choreography or the choreography of others. Um, Flipgrid is huge. So I don't know if you have like media artists, but if you have them do like a flip grid right there, they can talk about it um, and videotape it. And then our last artistic process really focuses in on that, the bottom part of our South Carolina um, profile of a graduate, where we're talking about the life and career characteristics, um, especially with that global perspective. Connecting, this is actually the one that it's the same across the board. The standard, the wording for the artistic process, the um, indicators are the same in theater, design, media arts, uh, not quite dance, a little different in dance because, you know, we have to be different, but um, it's the same. It all talks about how we can relate artistic ideas and works um, with personal meeting and external context. That's actually coming straight from that connecting standard. Um, and then those indicators, it's just talking about how the students can connect your art form to something outside of them, whether it is history or culture, um, whether it is their like career choices. If you talk about, um, how you, they can apply this art form um, to a career that falls under the connecting standard. Um, I mentioned that dance had to be different. We added another indicator in here because um, we wanted to make sure that we connected not just to other disciplines, but also to health and well being. So we do have our like warming up um, standards in the connecting area. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so unlike previous art standards, we have had, since I've been teaching, we've had grade bands, we've had grade levels, and now we moved into the proficiency levels, which again, I know you've heard about this, but it is so very important. Unfortunately, not all of our students have the same opportunities in the arts. My students at Saluda River get six years of dance and then they never see it again. We don't have dance at middle school. We don't have dance at the high school level. So I know that like our high school theater teacher has actually brought in a dance artist in residence. Well, the students who come from my school are gonna have some background knowledge, but it's been probably three or four years since they've heard about it. So as a teaching artist, if you are called in by an arts educator, like when I call in artists in residence, I can tell them exactly where my students fall on this proficiency um, levels. But that theater high school teacher who called in the dance artist in residence, they didn't know their proficiency level. So when you go in, if you are not working with an arts educator from that school, you're gonna have to do some pre-assessments. I know that even though I told my artists and residents exactly where they fell with their um, proficiency level, she went ahead and did like a, a movement exercise so she could assess where, um, what that meant for, for her on those proficiency levels. So having some form of like a quick um, pre-assessment, just a way to, to watch those students um, get a basis of their skills will help you to know where you need to like gear your lessons for the remainder of that day or that week that you're working with those students. Because um, again, you, you just don't know who you're going to be called in um, to help with. For years, our PE teacher called in dance artists and um, residents. So PE standards are different from art standards. Um, they're similar to a degree, but um, very different there. Um, so if you have that background knowledge of 
what like what the sample learning targets are for those proficiency levels, it'll help you and help you guide where to go. Um, next slide. This is exactly the same as what Mr. Simpson shared earlier, but again, very important that you realize when you're called into that high school, you, especially our theater artists and residents here, you could be called in by an English teacher to teach Shakespeare. Um, so if you're called in even to a high school, they're not necessarily at the advanced level. They might not have all of those experiences with the arts. So you can work through those novice standards pretty quick um, to get them to where you think they should be. Um, cause even at the high school level, they might be able to pick it up quicker just cause they are older. They have more life experiences, but it's okay to work at a novice level with high school students. Um, me personally, my fifth graders are at an intermediate low. Um, so don't just think that novice is elementary, intermediate is middle and advanced is high. Um, that's a common misconception with these proficiency levels. You are using them to meet the students where they are um, and how you can push them into the next level. But again, it helps you to meet them where they are. Um, the arts do require those learners to be disciplined, dedicated, and to demonstrate a strong work ethic. So we know as artists in residence, as arts educators, that we are helping our South Carolina students to meet that profile. We are providing them with world-class knowledge. We have these rigorous standards. We are able to meet those students where they are and help them to go even further with those proficiency levels. We know that we are reinforcing those world-class skills by allowing them to be creative, allowing them to, to communicate using their arts vocabulary. Um, we're helping them to make connections to other parts of the world, other time periods, um, especially with those connecting standards. And then, those life and career characteristics that are so very important, integrity, self-direction, perseverance, interpersonal skills, when we have them working in small groups, when we have them turning and talking to other people, we are helping them to, again, work on those life and career characteristics that we want from all of our South Carolina graduates. Next slide. Yay. Um, so I found all of this information um, from our South Carolina standards, which are posted in our chat boxes, as well as our national core art standards, which when we were writing them, we did look at those national core art standards. Um, we did not adopt all of them, um, but we did use some of those ideas to help reinforce what our South Carolina students um, need to know. One quick note, especially since I feel like we have a couple of theater people, um, there are in your, perf in your standards, there are boxes that are left blank. If they are left blank, that means that you don't necessarily have that proficiency level. Um, I feel like, I think it's theater that has just the novice ones filled out and then the rest are blank. If that's the case, then that's where that indicator stops. Um, it might just have like one at the intermediate, one at the advanced, and that's where they, they are. Any questions? <laughs> That was a lot of information. So if you have any questions of Kayla, um, type it in the chat or raise your electronic hand. Um, let's use her as a resource while she's here. What, would you, what do you want to know?
I don't know, but I'm pretty impressed that, that we have Sheila going off to a ballet class that made my day. <laughs> She's good that way. I love it. Yep. No questions. It's, it's a lot, but as you're looking at the residency program that you're bringing, just remember that you are helping our South Carolina graduates to meet that profile. Um, and again, those standards, we, we had this document in front of us the entire time. Well, both documents, the National Core Art Standards and then that profile. And we kept going back. How are we helping to make our students achieve these goals? Well, thank you, Kayla. I appreciate all that. <clears throat> um, there is a question from Anita. So if you are teaching, if you go into the classrooms, I know that typically at Saluda River, we call our artists in for a week long residency. If you are seeing them for like a, a longer project, then you might actually have an indicator from each of the artistic processes, but it would only be like one. So maybe you are having them, I'm gonna actually use what my artists and residents did this year. So she started out with African dance. And so they were making connections to that culture. They learned that choreography and they, they performed it. So that's connecting. They had one connecting indicator that they did for her beginning. And then they had a presenting. Then she had them um, move on and make a connection to um, hip hop dance and how it kind of like transformed and morphed over time. And so she taught the history of um, hip hop and then they performed it. The last day, they had to um, like show how, what type of movements they considered like West African and what type of movements they considered hip hop. So that was a little bit of creating, but we didn't even use that indicator. It was really just the two with the connecting and the presenting and that's okay. Um, but if you have like a, a longer unit where you actually are looking at the students, giving them plenty of time to respond, because while she had them turning and talking, they actually even went over to like small corners and wrote down characteristics of the dance styles. That wasn't necessarily our biggest focus. So we didn't even include that responding indicator um, in our final write up. And uh, Anita, when I do a, a theater residency on my planning form and then my post uh, residency documentation, I usually end up with three or four maximum um, that I that I've really focused on in the course of a week. Other questions? This isn't a question, but I just kind of want to highlight what Kayla was saying about her students having that dance experience in elementary school, but not having it in the middle or high school. A lot of times schools are meeting um, those standards by bringing in artists and residents. So that's one of the reasons why it's so important that you as a, as a teaching artist are addressing standards because there may not be a dance teacher in those schools and you may be the way that they're fulfilling their, their standards. So just another reason why that's important. To piggyback off of what Kimberly just said, when Saluda River first became an art school, we only met our dance requirement because we brought in artists and residents. So we had that artist in residence, I think at the time it was just that full week, but during that week, that's when my students got that that dance instruction. And that was their only exposure to it 
until I started teaching here. Um, so y'all really do fulfill a huge role in helping these students to get access to this arts area. And that, again, why it's so important that you have an idea of those standards. Very cool. Again, Kayla, thank you for all your work. And uh, I'd like to just take a minute. Um, I'm going to call your name and I want you to tell me what art form you work in and any sort of experience you have had sharing residencies with students. And as you can imagine, and in Zoom, everybody's screen looks different. So I will call your name in the order that I have you. And if I call your name, unmute and just talk to us for a minute. Just one minute. Okay, you ready? And I'm going to start with Henry, Henry Cook. Unmute and tell us who you are. Um, my name is Henry Cook, and I'm a visual artist. And um, I'm teaching at Welcome Elementary and wanted to bring some um, visiting artists and dance. <laughs> I know we just saw right? there, Kayla, talking about dance, um, um, into my school. So I wanted to, to learn a little bit with this um, webinar. Cool. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brutalize this. Davalyn, did I say that right? You didn't brutalize it. You were close. It's Davalyn, like javelin no. with a D. Please forgive me. Oh, you're forgiven. Um, I work with Speaking Down Barriers, which is a organization in Spartanburg, um, started as poetry and conversation. And so we want to be able to um, go into schools. We have been going anyway, uh, like today even. Uh, we went and did, I talked about haiku and did like a haiku slam. And so to be able to connect that with the South Carolina Arts Commission so that um, we can, you know, be able to do it more often with different schools is, is our goal. Cool, thank you. Uh, Carol, Carol Cannon. Carol is frozen. It's not me this time. All right, well, Carol is working on her electrons. Anita, Anita Dolman, who are you? <laughs> Hi there. I'm a visual artist. I teach mobile painting events, basically. I'm, I'm not a teaching artist. This is something new that I'm exploring. Uh, I love kids. I've always worked with kids for many, many years through, well, I have children and they're grown now, but I've also worked in scouts. I've taught many different things. Um, my, you know, I, I teach painting um, and I am skilled in various types of um, acrylic and mixed media art um, and new different techniques that are that are maybe trending now. So I teach mostly adults, but I also teach kids and I would love to start doing the artist in residence programs. What my goal is in coming to these trainings is to find out where the greatest needs are, where I can help the most. Because I, in exploring, you know, observing my own kids' education, I see that they're not challenged as much as they could be. And my goal would be to see how I can challenge them by making them think out of the box using art, um, you know, visual arts specifically. So that's Ooh. why I'm here. And I see you have a question, and we'll get to it after everybody's done their little introductions here. Um, Max. Tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Max. I also work with Speaking Down Barriers along with Davlin. Uh, so I was in the class today uh, with the student. And um, I'm really new to this uh, part of the process. Um, I'm looking to also uh, utilize my gifts and my talents to take to the schools, to the kids. Uh, because one of the things that I experienced today was um, just giving kids uh, alternative ways to express themselves, create, uh, and also view it as uh, something that they can do uh, in the world, um, maybe even as a living. Uh, I learned that pretty late in life, 
Uh, and most of it learned it through speaking out barriers that, um, you know, you can use poetry and art to uh, uh, push your uh, gift, as it were, or to uh, use it as a form of activism. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be uh, on the front lines, as it were, all the time. And I think a lot of young people see what's going on around them and around us and don't know how they fit in. To, to, to speaking out against it or um, evoking some sort of change with the way they see things. Um, I know we've noticed uh, that youth have been a big part of the mobilization of uh, awareness, as it were, uh, recently. So um, part of my goal is to uh, make that a, a realistic thing for those who are creative and just are not being pointed in that right direction. Um, so I was struggling with trying to figure out all those terms and, 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 and codes to meet the standards. But as I listened to you all and I kind of went through those links, it started to make sense. I started to connect the dots. So now I'm, I'm getting excited as to uh, how those things can be implemented. Excellent. Welcome aboard. <laughs> uh, Betsy, are you there? Tell us. I think he froze. Is Betsy there? I am. Okay. I'm just super smart with all this stuff. So you're doing fine. There we go. Um, I, I'm Beth Kassan with the um, South Carolina Children's Theater up in Greenville, and I'm the education director. So I don't personally go into classrooms to do the teaching. Um, I'm sending our artists out as needed. So um, and it, and I just I've been sending emails out while you guys have been talking to find out how as an organization we can get listed in the arts directory and um, starting to figure out which of my teaching artists I want to get officially certified through that so um, sim similar uh, under having the 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 minutia the all the letters and numbers explained to me it was like oh now I understand it okay now I can understand how how this all fits together um, and uh, can better um, a lot of times what we're dealing with is people that are seeking uh, to, to bring their kids to a show or to, um, you know, legitimize, you know, the, this uh, story drama exercise that they know that we do well, but they have to, they have to sell it up to their admin, the, their principal has to approve it. So if I can give them those tools so it can get sold up the chain, that's, that's where I oftentimes use those standards. So. Thank you so much for um, for today, and uh, I look forward to getting more information through all that I've been typing. Great, thank you. All right, Alicia, are you there? Hi, my name is Alicia Leak. I'm a South Carolina visual artist. I'm a full time professional artist. I've been a roadshow warrior, and I also teach, um, but I teach mostly older people, and I've been asked to teach some younger people in the homeschool and I asked the homeschoolers whether they had standards and I did not get an answer and then I saw this pop up and I said this is exactly where I need to be at the right time. <laughs> I am on the South Carolina artist directory and was just informed that I'm still current but and I want to get that other certification that follows but there was there's been a gap in the time that I signed up with co before COVID and during COVID, I had to pivot to something else. And so I'm trying to make an exit strategy out of doing outdoor shows that, um, and I think I have some things to bring to the table in terms of teaching. Um, I am here to put the A in STEAM, to, uh, to, in STEM to make STEAM rather. And I am a science girl and I wanna educate people about the importance of plankton and our environment. And I just educated probably a hundred adults in Hilton Head last weekend, and I was actually able to capture their attention. And I have proof that my, what I did in person drove them to my website to find out more with my Google Analytics. And I was floored that I had people actually listen to what I said. So maybe I can be of benefit to some young people and I'm looking forward to it and I wanna learn more. So here I am. Sweet, welcome, Dad. Let us know about you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, well, I'm a musician and I do like community residencies where everybody 
explores their history, heritage, and culture, and we turn it into music and songs and do things from life cycles to habitats, environments, different aspects of their cultural heritage, historical things that have gone on in their area and region. So I'm on the roster and I'm a certified artist, I guess, in music, went through that deal. So uh, that's kind of what I do. Great. And John. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can oh, hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm Johnny Tempest Fowler. I'm a storyteller. I've uh, been at this uh, business for, gosh, about 40 years or so, close to it. And um, I'm on the uh, roster, I've been on the roster for about 35 years, maybe, or so. I remember uh, being at some of the booking conferences and Jeff and myself and Thad and we were all very young folks back in those days, so I've gone through several cycles, and I actually have my, my copy of my standards here, you know, uh, I've been looking at them while we've been talking, because I'm working on a music residency right now, and uh, and I want to uh, connect with my uh, teacher that uh, I'm working with. So uh, I do that, and also uh, I do some storytelling, theater type work, and I've just finished a residency, uh, gosh, but three or four weeks ago with that and so I stay pretty pretty busy with all that sort of stuff but I'm always wanting to go to uh, you know, places like this to uh, to keep trying to catch up so to speak you know stay, stay, and just stay right there with them and see what's, what's going on what's new and I do not have my uh, the uh, 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 the teaching artist stat status the one that you know put a little star but i'm going to be I'm make an application for that uh, this this summer as well so we've got some of things in the in the uh in the little machine going anyway it's great to be here and i'm enjoying it great all right thank you all for sharing and uh we're gonna um kimberly are you ready to uh, administer the survey as we're, we're getting near the end here. So Kimberly's gonna do a survey and then I'll say thank you to all of our partners. So Kimberly, it's all you. All right, I am dropping a link in the chat to a quick Google form. I wasn't as high tech as Roger today with the QR code, but you know, um, you can click the link right in the um, chat box. And if you'll take just about two or three minutes and fill out a quick survey for us, that will really help us get some information about what you as teaching artists need for any future professional development, um, as well as just giving us some feedback on today's webinar. So if you don't mind clicking that, you can complete it right now. We'll give you just a couple of minutes. And while you're doing that, I um, just based on some of the um, responses to who each of you are. Um, I just wanted to share that we are going to be adding organizational listings to the South Carolina Arts Directory very soon. So um, for Davlin and um, Betsy, just be on the lookout for that. I've also written your names down so that I can make sure to let you know when that is is up and available so that your organizations can be added. And those teaching artists that are working with those organizations will be eligible to apply for, or will be eligible to be teaching artists that are paid for through South Carolina Arts Commission grant funding. Um, so a lot of the grant funding from the commission requires that those teaching artists be listed at least on the arts directory. So as an organization being listed, that would enable you to receive that funding as well. And if anyone else has questions or anything that you might want to ask or add during um, this survey time, then feel free to shout out. Carol Cannon, can you hear me? Yes, hi Carol. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I, I finally got it unmuted. Uh, I just wanted to say that I'm a classical singer and, and that I have been an artist in residence in Texas uh, 
I've been an artist in residence in Oklahoma and Arkansas, but never in Texas, but I am on the roster and it was helpful today. I need to get busy on all of these standards uh, because each state is different because all of those states were different, Oklahoma, but I lived in Texas and I have been a full-time faculty member on two different uh, university faculties. Uh, along with the artist in residency. So it's it's been a really exciting life for me. And but I want to do now with South Carolina <laughs> as an artist teacher. So I hope I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> Everybody look like your eyes are up. So I'm gonna go on. Oh, Kimberly, thank you for the survey. Um, Amanda, if I could have my 11th slide. <clears throat> All right, this webinar will continue tomorrow for another two hours. We are going to take the information that Roger and Kayla shared with us, and we're gonna get very practical. How do we use the standards in lesson planning and in arts integrated lesson planning? And so it, we hope to see you tomorrow from four to six. Um, and join us, tell your friends. They, they don't have to attend today to come tomorrow, but bring anybody you want, have them register just like you did. And it's the same link tomorrow. All right, if we could have my final slide, please, Amanda. I would like to thank all of the folks at the South Carolina Arts Commission, the ABC Project, the South Carolina Department of Education and the Arts Grow SC program for all of their work in supporting teaching artists. I'd especially like to thank today our pilot, Amanda. Thank you, dear. I'd like to thank our co-pilot, Kimberly. I'd like to thank Roger and Kayla for all of your great information. And I hope to see all of you further down the road. If you have any questions, feel free to email us, call us. You, we've presented our information all over the place. So that's great from Alicia. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you all. And I'll, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>